Okay, first of all, I would like to thank the organisers for having accepted my paper proposal. And at the time, said paper proposal, a bit like Jane's, was hugely optimistic. And given that this is my first venture into a very unfamiliar territory, uh, both historically as well as geographically, um, presenting in front of an audience of experts in Scottish history, art and archaeology and not being any of these things is a bit dangerous, I think. Uh, my hope is to stimulate discussion um, and feedback and to have some questions and hopefully I will be the first one to benefit from all of these. Um, unfortunately, and are surprisingly, I have no new theory on the Forest Monument and its iconography, only a handful of suggestions and slightly different interpretative angle. When I first came across the Swerno Stone, my main idea was to apply to this particular monument the same methodology that has been used to consider some Anglo-Saxon material. The topic of Romanitas is a flourishing and much discussed perspective in the study of Anglo-Saxon sculpture that has been trickling down more and more in the study of Pictish sculpture as well. I thought that it would be interesting and worth investigating why the Romanesque of Sueno Stone, a monument which could be considered astonishing and unique only just for its dimensions, had never been fully exploited, only touched upon, and I thought almost taken for granted, both with regards to its form as well as possibly to its iconography. I also thought that I could include the forest monument in the pillar obelisk debate that has inflamed the study, um, early study, of the Rutherland Newcastle crosses. The results presented in this paper seem to reveal a different story, which, if you will excuse the pun, is much less set in stone. However, my first impression has stayed the same, that the Forest Monument has so far received limited or partial attention, and that some of its most conspicuous characteristics have gone virtually unnoticed. And that finally, comparisons, even if with material which is chronologically and geographically very distant, can hopefully prove useful to enhance appreciation of its romanitas. The structure of the paper will be as follows. First, there's an overview of how the Forest <coughs> Monument has been approached by the scholarship, um, highlighting some of the most and least discussed aspects. This will lead to a description, drawing attention to iconographical conundrums that the sculpture presents. And I will then try to gain insight from a number of parallels with other monuments, discussing in particular the form of the sculpture. I do regret to have used the name Swenerstone in the title of the paper, as it perpetuates an inaccurate association with the Viking leader Swain Forkbeard, who raided England in the late 10th and early 11th century. The connection was first proposed in 1726 and reaffirmed by later writers, but although Viking links have not been dismissed in some of the interpretations of the monument, there is no correlation with that particular Viking. The other claim that should be dispelled at the onset of the discussion is that the monument was moved or re-erected in its present location. The main reason to argue this is the lack of mentions before the 17th and 18th centuries. However, in his report on the excavations carried out before erecting the glass pavilion um, into which the monument is now encased, McCullough states that the condition of the stone, with the loss of detail concentrating on the top um, and the absence of any flower scars, seem to be inconsistent with the stone's supposed long um, recumbent stay below, gra below ground. He added as well that the excavations actually served as a reminder of the sheer size of the Swerner stone and its massive base, and that ultimately it seems more reasonable to presume that the stone stands where it always stood. The Forest Monument was described quite succinctly in John Stewart's Sculpture Stones of Scotland, published in 1856, which however included in very many drawings. Um, the account of, in um, the uh, early Christian monuments of Scotland did not provide any interpretation, but remains the standard description until more recent times. The contribution of David Seller, uh, Leslie Southwick and Anthony Jackson published between 1979 and 1984, started to further elaborate on the iconography of the monument and its potential significance. It's interesting to note how they all provided slightly different historical context, but at the same time they all focused almost exclusively on the battle scene on the east face of the cross, of the, of the monument. Um, Seller believed that the monument commemorated a real event and had an immediate secular purpose. He argued that the battle represented was a great victory of the Scots, possibly led by Kenneth McAlpin, over the northern Picts. In his view, this interpretation also explained the lower panel on the west face, which is the one um, in the slide, which he read as the ceremonial inauguration of the new Scottish ruler. 
Southwick reading supported a view of the forest imagery as a celebration of real battle, but conceded that it could have been commissioned as a funerary monument in honour of the leader of said victorious battle. The winners for him are the, the men of Moray, the northern Picts, over the Orkney Vikings or the Scottish kings south of the Mount. Although Southwick offered a full and detailed description of all the faces of the monument, there's no attempt on his part to integrate them into one iconographical programme. The lower panel on the west face um, is described by him as some kind of meeting and ultimately deemed too weathered to provide any kind of sensible interpretation. Jackson's understanding of the iconography and meaning of the monument seems to be almost entirely based on numerical explanations. After carefully counting the various actors in the scenes depicted, the ratio in the dimension of the stone, the number of sections in which the monument is divided, he concluded that the insistence on the number seven um, represented the final defeat, again at the hands of Kenneth McAlpin, of all the royal lineages of the seven regions of provinces of Pictland. Jackson went further, affirming that this was a victory of the Christian Scots over the pagan Picts. And the lower panel on the west face, uh, for him, symbolises the coronation of Kenneth MacAlpin, flanked by St Columba and St Andrew. Of all these people that I've mentioned so far, Sella is the first one, at least in this cursory overview, um, to suggest a parallel with the Trajan column in Rome, which he um, attributed just to a personal comment uh, by the then curator of the Tal Talbot Rice Gallery in Edinburgh. So that's the first mention that we have of any connection between this monument and the Trajan column. And he's not motivated, he's just like something that someone has said, basically. Um, two 2004 publications included extremely relevant and refreshing observations on the Forest Monument, and these are um, Leslie Alcock's Kings and Warriors, which I discuss in further detail below, and the Henderson's Art of the Picts, from which the title of the paper is taken. Um, the passage from the Henderson's volume um, deserves to be quoted in full because it's the other, basically, explicit admission of Romanitas for this monument. Um, and I quote, The Forest Monument rams home its military iconography. Swenna stone is on an unusually ambitious scale. In this respect, it is as likely to be a conscious cultural gesture by a 9th century patron fresh from a visit to Rome, who wanted the equivalence of the column of Trajan and Marcus Aurelius on his doorstep, as that we should regard the camp scenes, parades and massacres as an intelligible act of local reportage. McCulloch noted how the different interpretations have so far focused on several but distinct aspects of decoration, and there seems to be a lack of interest or willingness to consider the monument as a whole. To this, I would like to add that one of the most obvious features um, of the monument, its dimensions, um, is often mentioned only in relation to the sense of awe that the monument inspires, or the difficulties that it must have presented in terms of creation. I think that the size of the forest cross lab, as well as its location, need to be considered in terms of symbolic significance. And its decoration, as well, need a more holistic approach. So it's time for a closer look at the monument, what it actually looks like. Um, the so-called Sueno Stone is the tallest extant Pictish monument and amongst the tallest monuments in the British Isles. It's taller than the St John's, St. John's Cross at Eliona, taller than <coughs> Rutherland View Castle, taller than the Gosforth Cross. Um, it's over six metres tall, but it's easy to note how the top of the monument, um, being very weathered, could have allowed for the loss of, um, of some part of the monument. The base, as well, is encased in a collar stone, which partially obscures it. Um, so it's likely that the full height of the stone was greater than what is possible to observe now. Not that there's 12 feet below the ground, because that was also um, something that was believed, that the monument kind of continued, basically, under, underground for like um, almost as much as it was uh, above ground. So that's not the case. The west face that you can see here is divided in three sections, representing a cross in raised profile with a figural scene underneath. The top section is occupied by the cross head, um, <coughs> sorry, ringed and with fairly short symmetrical arms. The background of this section seems to have been originally plain, but overall there's considerable damage <coughs> to the carving and to the surface of the stone. The central section, so you can see that, well, the section is clearly, it's clearly delimited. You see, like, there's a kind of horizontal line there. So that's the central section, the top section, and the bottom section. 
The central section contains a cross shaft filled with interlaced spiral knotwork. The cross is on a rectangular base filled with a second pattern of circular interlaced knotwork. The side panels are also decorated with a third different pattern of circular interlaced knotwork, slightly larger in scale. The fact that the cross is on a base is significant, at least to me. Iconographically, the dual cross raised on a mound or stepped base represents a combined allusion to both the cross of Golgotha, site of the crucifixion, and the heavenly Jerusalem of the book of Revelation. This kind of representation of the cross is one of the principal themes of apse decoration in the early Christian churches of Rome. It seems to be rarely depicted in Anglo-Saxon sculpture, although a cross on a stepped base is found at Kirkdale, and on a tomb cover, and both Wearmouth and Jarrow, which are here in this slide, offer famous examples of large-scale monuments decorated with a stepped cross. The cross at Wearmouth is also a funerary monument. In Scotland, stepped crosses appear now and also at St. Vigens. It seems that there's two, at least two monuments that have a stepped cross um, on them. Um, but there's also the St. Orland stone at Cossens, um, a cross slab at Fowlis Wester, and a fragment at Rosemarkey, possibly belonging to a shrine. Um, all these examples present a fairly square base, um, as you've seen in one of the slides of Jane's paper. Um, and it, you can see, like, in this kind of base here, it's not the kind of full rectangle that you can see there. Um, so the forest monument lies on a rectangular step that takes the whole width of the slab. This does not leave out, at least to me, the possibility that the cross at forest intentionally included a reference to the stepped cross, which seems particularly appropriate, especially on a funerary, on a funerary monument. The lowermost section is extremely weathered it contains a central figure being flanked or protected or honoured or adored by two arched large figures in profile with uh, distinctive hairstyles. Um, they're not, they don't seem to be exactly the same kind of hairstyle. Um, each one of them in turn is flanked by a smaller figure which is not in the same position. The one on the right is slightly higher than the one on the left. Um, the scene is difficult to interpret. It could be a meeting or some kind of liturgical ceremony. There's also something here that I can't quite figure out what it is. Because, like, this is the smaller figure on the left side. This is the smaller figure on the right side. But there's, there seems to be something here as well, um, which may add to um, the kind of iconography of the scene. The east face, uh, which you've seen in the opening slide, uh, is the most widely reproduced and discussed, and represents supposedly phases of a battle. We cannot and should not, though, take for granted that the scenes pertain all to the same events. They could portray different campaigns, different conquests, different defeat, or even not be related um, at all <coughs> to real events, despite the incredible amount of details. The East Space is divided in four sections of different size, each one tightly packed with a large number of figures and apparently subdivided in further panels. The top section, which you can see here, is very weathered, but it seems to um, contain rows of horsemen moving from right to left. And is followed by two horsemen, this one larger, and then two more rows of horsemen, all moving um, in the same direction. Uh, the horses, though, are not like prancing or galloping. They're kind of quite st static. And the scene overall seems quite static. The following section is the largest um, and most complex. It contains five armed figures depicted frontally, the central one bigger and wearing a different outfit, interpreted as a leader. Below them, eight more figures, the two in the middle facing each other and seem to be engaged in combat. Further below, so this is all one section, this and this, this kind of central section is all one, divided by these quite clear lines on the top and on the bottom. And then there's kind of internal subdivisions, but they're not marked by any kind of anything in the sculpture. The beheading or siege panel, um, there's a central structure flanked to the right by three figures with spears and to the left one more figures and a group of heads. 
the heads is the, are the things that have attracted the most attention in anyone that has commented on this on this um, monument, and I will not comment on the heads. Um, behind the pile of heads, there are six headless bodies, and below another figure is beheaded, flanked to the right by three more figures holding possibly trumpets, and to the left by two pairs engaged in combat. Finally, there's three rows of horsemen um, being followed or chased by archers. Um, the third section, so this third section here, contains a canopy, um, seven headless bodies, a heap of heads, one of which is framed, and further below, another man being executed. Next to him and on the sides, seven pairs of figures engaged in combat. There's a fourth and final section, just on the bottom, which is partially obscured by um, the base that encases it, uh, but it seems to depict two more rows of soldiers moving from the right to the left. So I don't want to speculate too much uh, about the military details of the scene. Um, I'd like to draw attention on a number of stylistic elements. The carvings are quite two-dimensional, the surface almost flattened, despite the crowd of figures and simultaneous actions. Although many have commented on the immediacy of the conflict, the effect to me is quite not very dynamic. The uniformity of the figures, both in their dimensions and regular arrangement in rows upon rows, adds to this overall impression. Another element in the composition which should not be overlooked is the carefully marked division in sections, which seems to contrast with the often free-flowing representation of these pictorial scenes on pictures, sculptures, and I'm thinking especially of uh, hunting scenes, for example. The narrow faces of the forest monuments are also divided in sections and decorated with fine, <coughs> fine scroll inhabited with human figures. The lowest panels, both on the north and on the south face, show human figures. Now, vine scroll inhabited by human figures is very unusual in Scotland. And one of the most common comparisons for this type of iconography is a very classical looking fragment uh, from Jarrow, in which a human figure dressed in a short tunic with parallel tubular folds is depicted striding across a thick plant scroll. Um, an animal on the top here, you can see its muzzle and its like paws, um, is also entwined in its branches and gnawing. In this piece, Rosemary Trump observed that the depiction of a classical hunting scene coexisted with the Christian interpretation of the struggle of man against the forces of evil, which are probably represented by animals. And um, after lunch, we heard Heather's as well, um, her observations about the idea of entanglement and sin, um, which, in my opinion, kind of tie in quite well with the fact that on the west face of um, the cross lap, we have a cross as a symbol of um, salvation and triumph. Um, so you've got like sin, entanglement and sin on the sides, and you've got salvation and triumph on the main face of the cross. So we've seen so far, most interpretations of the forest monument are based almost exclusively on the east face. Um, Alcock seems to be an exception, having appreciated at least how the west face, with its monumental interlaced field cross, is rarely taken into full account. His interpretation is unusual and worth considering. He read the panel below the cross, the panel on the west face, as a pilgrimage devotion scene. The central figure with barely recognizable feet, tunic, and possibly a head is said to be so weathered because of devout pilgrims kissing or touching him. It is suggested that the central figure could be Christ himself, and with the addiction of flanking figures, the scene could represent the nativity, the baptism, or the arrest of Christ. He remarks that the erosion of the central figure on the lower panel um, could be accepted as a sign of devotion. And in that case, we have here one of the most precious icons of Lake Pictish sculpture. Now, I'm a bit um, puzzled by this interpretation because I wonder if we know of any parallels for such a devotional practice at this date and in a similar context. Um, although the, the position of this particular panel at the base of the cross would make it accessible um, at eye level and a kind of kind of touch level. Um, um, as far as I'm aware, even considering Anglo-Saxon England and the continent, piety and pilgrimage and devotion seem to take very different patterns. Um, and so this interpretation is um, original and evocative, but is a bit speculative. Um, concerning the pictorial face with the battle scene, Arcot justly emphasizes that it is one of the three representation of battles in the art of Northern Britain. The other two are the cross slab at Abelemno and the Frank's casket. 
One of Alcock's most interesting observations is questioning how to read the scene. Is it an episodic narrative or is it a continuous narrative? Or is there any narration at all? Alcock's approach to the decapitation is also quite refreshing. It argues that even if the decapitation could be the fate of the defeated, it seems doubtful that the flow of an actual battle would be interrupted for such a purpose. Um, and also, realistic depiction of the battles show that when um, slashing weapons are used, you don't really get these neat piles of head, like pieces of like bodies are kind of scattered all over the place. So it's a very matter-of-fact approach, which I quite like. Um, it allows also for Alcott's more symbolic interpretation of the decapitation scene, which he read as the representation of a great ceremonial occasion. And he provided also one sculpted parallel um, on the North Cross of Aheni, uh, dated to the late 9th century. Now, Apart from all these considerations, how can we actually put the forest monument in relation to Roman triumphal columns? Can we do that? Um, can the form of this sculpture tell us anything about the possible function and its potential romances? Um, when considering Anglo-Saxon monuments, the connection with triumphal columns developed along two lines. On the one hand, we have uh, the obelisk debate linked to Rutland and Newcastle, and on the other, the existence of a number of sculpture with truly columnar form, like Massum, Ricalver and Dewsbury. We got Massum here on the right. The uh, obelisk debate was initiated by Fred Orton and based on the theory that the um, early Anglo-Saxon high crosses had an original non-cruciform shape, amended with cross-shaped terminals to make them coherent and acceptable within a later religious phase of patronage. This perspective ignores the fact that ecclesiastical patrons were more than likely to invoke and signify the Romanitas of an obelisk in combination with its cruciform shape providing a layering of meaning, inspiration and implications, which is typical of this period. At the same time, the columnar form, so redolent of Roman association and unique of Anglo-Saxon England, there's no other early medieval columns, um, especially sculpted columns like these. There's only these three in Anglo-Saxon England from this period. Um, but they were so unusual that for a long time they were only understood as part of a native high cross form. And so you see Collingwood reconstruction as the Masson form as sort of like the base of a high cross. In Scotland, the only example of a freestanding three-dimensional cross is the Duckling Cross, and there's no evidence of columnar column monuments. The forest sculpture is definitely a cross slab. It's not topped by a cross, statue or capital. Certainly, it doesn't have a round section. So calling it a triumphal column could meet with some objections. However, I believe that the sheer size of the monument with its obvious emphasis on verticality, combined with the theme, style and arrangement of the decoration, allow and almost invite such an interpretation. The subject of the decoration is certainly consistent with the celebratory, victorious and military focus of Roman triumphal columns. The arrangement of the scenes clearly in clearly mapped registers doesn't have a spiral movement, which is more appropriate for round shafts, and it makes it more compatible with the idea of an obelisk. And um, I would like to mention at this point that there were two pyramids at Glastonbury, described by William of Malmesbury as standing outside the church in the cemetery and being tall, slender and flat at the top. One was almost eight meter high and the other 5.5 meters. Uh, Dodwell argued that the word pyramid was used um, here and in other instances as a synonym for a funerary monument in connection, unsurprisingly, with Rome, where pyramids, there were pyramids in Rome. And these pyramids in Rome, at least two known from the Middle Ages, from like in the Middle Ages, there were still two known, um, there were funerary monuments. The Glastonbury pyramids were tall, divided into panels, and decorated with carvings. In the corpus for Anglo-Saxon stone sculpture, it said that Glastonbury, a Celtic foundation, may well have kept the tradition of marking graves with a column. And in addition, pyramid was the term used by uh, Edmer's account to describe both the tomb of Dunstan at Canterbury as well as that of Archbishop Oda. And we're talking um, second half of the 10th century here. So there were two Glastonbury pyramids. Um, it calls to mind the two tall closet, crosses that flank a tomb at Penrith, also dated to the 10th century. Um, and these are also a fairly tall monument, um, over three meters tall. It's fair to reveal that there's the possibility that there were in fact two monuments at Forest as well, two curiously carved pillars, um, which are represented quite clearly in one of Timothy, 
Timothy Pont's maps dated in the 1590s. So there is the possibility that there was another monument there. So these aspects shared by the forest monuments and by other monuments um, seem to fall broadly under the umbrella of Roman inspiration. In addition to their triumphal or celebratory significance, tall monuments in a columnar or obelisk form could mark, contain, or represent graves. This monument could occur in pairs and be decorated with tiered panels containing both carved images or inscriptions. But why forests? Can allusion to Romanesque be found in the landscape where the monument was erected? Lawrence Kepi postulated the possibility of Roman installations north of the Grampians and possible Roman sites between Forest and Inverness. In this area, the fort at Burthead was a power centre for centuries, and um, it has been postulated that there was also a Christian site immediately outside the fort, as well as possible ritual or religious association represented by a sacred well. The fort does not seem to have precedent Roman connections, um, and the reuse of Roman forts in Scotland is extremely, extremely rare. rare. But even if um, this was not the case, um, there could be a sort of like potential long lasting symbolic significance in the area around the forest, um, also enhanced by the sculptures cave, which is um, around here. So you've got Burnhead here, you've got the sculptures cave about here, you've got forest here. And you've got the Tarba Peninsula that Professor Carver talked about this morning, just across the water. Now, we've heard about Port Mahomac um, this morning. Um, it said that Port Mahomac um, was a Columban foundation. And it's also said that there was possibility of an Episcopal see in the Roman tradition at Rosemarkey. And um, in the early 8th century, as reported by Bede, King Necton asking, asked Chelfred Abbot of Wehrmacht Jarrow, <coughs> for support and advice in making his kingdom more Roman, both in liturgical observance as well as architectural practice. It seems that following this, there was an attempt of a reorganization of Pictish church. Um, it's uncertain how much control Necton had on the northern parts of Pictland or how successful and thorough he was in his purge um, of the, the Columban elements. But what seems interesting to me is that at least at the beginning of the 8th century, uh, there was a nominal push for Romanesque in the re regions of Pitland, neighbouring with Northumbria, both in religious and artistic customs. Although it's difficult to assess how far north this push reached and what was the political and religious status of the Tarba Peninsula in the 9th century, um, I would like to stress the possibility of this coexistence uh, between Columban and Roman element in certain areas of Pitland. And I like the idea of Professor Carver's this morning of like a dialogue of monuments. Um, I'm almost imagining like the, the cross here at Forest and the monuments on the Tarba Peninsula kind of communicating with each other. Um, it seems to me that this whole area, even if these monuments um, at Fort Mahomac and beyond are probably earlier than um, the monument at Forest, awareness of their existence must have been, must have stayed in the area, in my opinion. And so that awareness, that reflection, that kind of um, influence, if you like, um, could have stayed in this area. Although it may be too simplistic to say that Forest was a significant location from a sacred perspective, um, it allows to introduce a powerful religious element in the background of our monument, independent from an individual patron, lay or ecclesiastical, and removes or reduces the need to postulate that a real battle at or near Forest was the main or only reason to choose this location. I would like to conclude just with a word on patronage. Uh, Stephen Driscoll said that monumental sculpture, more than any other evidence, reveals the increasing importance of the church in the social and political landscape of the pits. I believe this is applicable to the forest monument. Um, and I mentioned also um, Megan Gondock's observation that a piece of sculpture is a statement of power, not only because of the immediate visual messages, but as the culmination of a series of socially loaded processes. And this is most obvious in elaborate monument. Uh, Gondock has a complexity scale and we can underline the high level of sophistication of the forest monument and in turn the large amount of resources, material and symbolic, needed for its production, considering both its size, the fact that it's carved on all four faces and the detail and quantity of carvings. I'm not going to propose a patron for the forest monument or endorse any of the names that have been suggested in previous interpretation. 
Any monument form and its suggested patronage and function are not mutually exclusive concepts, but the possible coexistence of a multiplicity of perceptions and uses for these sculptures cannot be emphasized enough. Just as separating the concept of high cross, obelisk and column means dismissing the tendency to combine into something new, the inspiration draw from different sources, it seems clear that the forest cross slab was meant to project a multifaceted combination of references, both in its iconography and in its form. These included allusions to Romanesque, as well as religious and secular implications. The so-called Sueno stone, which despite its staggering height, seems to have gone a bit unnoticed, can be seen simultaneously as a cenotaph, a grave marker, a piece of propaganda, and especially a statement of Christian belief. I hope that my paper will contribute to put this triumphal cross back in the current discussion of early medieval Scotland. Thank you.